Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you're watching in the world. Welcome to the panel on Responsibility, Representation, and Restrictions, which is part of the York Festival Ideas. Uh, I, a few technical notes. If you're watching live, you can ask questions during the Q&A button on your screen. This is available throughout the event, so questions can be asked at any time. Should you have technical issues such as the loss of Wi-Fi, you can always rejoin the event using the original link. Please also remember that today's event is being recorded so you will be able to watch it again. Subtitles are available in the event, in this event. To turn these on or off, please use the CC Live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. It should be at the bottom right, um, towards the right of the uh, suite of buttons in the center of the screen. Let me introduce our panelists. Um, our first panelist is Dr. Sandy Bakshi. He's an associate professor of post-colonial and queer literatures and literary translation at the University of Paris, Denis Diderot. Sandy researches transnational queer and decolonial enunciations of knowledge. He received his PhD from the School of English, University of Leicester in the United Kingdom and is currently employed as co-editor of Decolonializing Sexualities, Transnational Perspectives, Critical Interventions, which is published by Oxford Counterpress in 2016. And Decolonial Trajectory is a special issue of interventions published in 2020. In his writing and his research, he focuses on queer and race problematics in post-colonial literatures and cultures. We welcome Sandeep. Dr. Diana Greenwald is an assistant curator of the collection of, at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston in the United States. Diana is an art historian and an economic historian whose work uses both statistical and qualitative analysis to explore the relationships between art and broader social and economic change and the resultant formation of inequalities. This year, she published her first book, Painting by Numbers, Data Driven Histories of 19th Century Art published by Princeton University Press. Welcome, Diana. Next up is Dr. Dan Hicks, who is a curator at Pitt Rivers Museum at Oxford University and a professor of contemporary archaeology there. Dan's work across his roles concerns the material and visual culture of the human past and present across the disciplines of archaeology, anthropology, art, and architecture. His current re research focus is on the restitution of African cultural heritage from European and American collections as well as studies of museum collecting and 19th century imperial legacies in architecture and archeology. span Next, we welcome Beth Hughes, who's a writer and curator. Uh, I should say, welcome, Dan. Next, we have Beth Hughes, who's a writer and curator at the Arts Council Collection, South Bank Center in London. Beth's practice is centered on the principle that everyone has the right to enjoy and participate in art. With a commitment to collaboration, access, equality, and diversity. She has worked as a series of galleries and curated hugely significant exhibitions alongside influential creators as well as continuing to prioritize the Arts Council support for emerging artists. Welcome Beth. And finally we have Dr. Terry Ochala who is an author and lecturer in world literatures in English at the Royal Holloway College University of London. She's a scholar of colonial and post-colonial Nigerian cultures and societies working in the interstices of literary studies, history, and post-colonial theory. Terry is particularly interested in archival practices, first-generation Nigerian writing, the history of elite colonial ed education in Africa, and the construction and performance of colonial subjectivities. Her first book, Achebe and Friends, at Mwaye, the Making of a Literary Elite won the African Studies Association, UK's Phage and Oliver Prize in 2016. She is also the author of a short history of Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart and is concluding her third book now, Effective States and Archival Excess, Nigeria Magazine and the Politics of Self Monumentality. Welcome, Terry. Welcome, all. Thank you for being here. Uh, I should also mention. Um, it's crucial to acknowledge the work of Sage Kima, who is the University of York History and Art Department student who reached out to me initially in a role as one of the event organizers. This panel, from what I understand, was her idea 
partly her idea, developed in response to this situation at their own art collection. As Sage communicated to me, our university, quote, our university collection is a mere 2.2% work by artists of color and the rest are white, unquote. We just want to acknowledge her labor and her courage and her insight and, and say that this panel was publicly, is publicly, we want to say that this panel is convened in large part due to Sage's work and ambitions. So thank you, Sage. Welcome all. Uh, I did have brief sort of introductory conversations with you all during the week last week, and we sort of sussed out um, what uh, some themes might be that can connect all of our interest and work. And uh, in, in uh, thinking about the title of this panel, Responsibility Representations Rest, uh, Restrictions, I thought it would be really useful to start off by talking about responsibility. And in um, each of your own um, disciplines and, and academic and curatorial work, who do you feel you are responsible to? Or what do you think you are responsible to? And anyone can start. So, okay, let's, let's go with Sandeep then, please. Right. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Seth. Um, thank you for um, inviting me. And I have three acknowledgements to make. Um, I'm in mourning at the moment, uh, but I do have three acknowledgements to make. One is, of course, to Sage Kima, who um, I'd like to acknowledge the intellectual labor because she invited me to this panel. And the way she conceptualized the panel, of course, will show how great dialogues will materialize today in disparate spaces of knowledge making from you know university to the museum it's truly unfortunate that she is not present with us today and the other two um, acknowledgements that i have to make is if i may i'd like to begin with a short reminder of the fire in central london at grenfell towers where 72 lives were lost four years ago i'd also like to commemorate Neela Kamal Gupta, a trans comrade of the South Asian diaspora, who I've known for more than 10 years now in both Brighton and London, and who ended their life a couple of days ago. The mobilization against injustice they led will carry on and may they rest in peace. Um, in terms of responsibility, who am I responsible to? So as an academic working in a higher education institution, i.e. the university, my foremost responsibility is to the university if responsibility is to be conceived in the most conventional manner. This does not mean that I will toe the official line. As part of the system, and by extension, my responsibility lies with generations of students I teach and engage with. Now, the responsibility is not simply um, carrying out duties of teaching, research, and administration, but in bringing to the discussion the significance, for me, of accountability, both ways. That is to say, seeking accountability from and being accountable to the partners of knowledge that is the university and the students. As for the university, I'm of the view that only a partial decolonization of the university is possible. We work after all in the global north and systems of territorial occupation and militarization precede our entry into the system. What we can do for me is one, point to the complicities of the system in upholding unequal distribution of power, both globally and otherwise, which of course leads to critique. But when it becomes a political demand, as we witnessed in the last decade or so, um, where the importance of decolonization is where the importance of decolonization resides. That is to say that student-led initiatives from South Africa to Britain have sparked us on a critical journey of self-reckoning. And I'm, I'm, I'm including myself in this self-reckoning. Universities produce knowledge, we know that, but they're not the only sites that produce knowledge and I can't stress this enough. And the role of the universities that they have arrogated to themselves for historical reasons we all know is validating knowledge. I'm sure I'm not one of the few scholars in the university articulating this point. There are several others who make this point before and um, with more elegance. In terms of my responsibility or the idea of accountability to the students and from the students, um, I believe um, in the active creation of knowledge itself, which means that a partnership between my students and myself as a teacher, educator, researcher, mentor can only develop if we think um, along lines of 
co-construction of knowledge, what in other contexts Paolo Bacchetta has called um, co-formation. So I don't want to take more time, and I think I'll, I'll chip in when others also um, have spoken about this. Thank you so much. Great, great. So um, if I may, um, Diana, can you answer that question? Who do you feel that you are responsible to? Um, thank you, Seth. And thank you, Sandeep, for such a beautiful first answer and series of acknowledgments. Um, I have sort of two sets of responsibilities. And part of this is kind of a split identity as a joint economic and art historian who's working in an academic space and then also as a museum curator who is creating programming and exhibitions for a public outside of a university space, right? So I'll, I'll start with the academic answer. Um, so I, my work, I use uh, basically statistics to try and recapture traces of works of art that existed in the 19th century, but haven't survived this kind of filtering and canon formation to make it into museums like the ones where I work or the MFA Boston across the street. So I feel a real responsibility to try and present a more honest view of cultural production in the past as best as we can capture it. And then by comparing that to the sample of artworks or artifacts that have survived and made it into preserved collections, understanding that filtering and editing process and all the ways in which it may be biased in one direction or another. So in a way, I feel responsibility to showing the restrictions if we're going to um, call mm. out a couple of the different titles of this panel. Mm. Um, in my museum work, I really feel responsible to the range of visitors who walk through our doors and the range of lived experiences that they bring to the Gardner. Um, for those of you who might not be familiar with the Gardner Museum in Boston, we're a very particular collection, kind of like a Venetian, we often say it's almost like a Venetian palazzo in the middle of Boston turned upside down and inside out. I'll let you Google it to see exactly what it looks like, but we're not the most typical museum experience. Um, and making the experience of stepping into this place and experiencing this collection welcoming um, is something that I feel very responsible to as a curator. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it there and hand it off to my fellow panelists. Cool. So if I May, Terry, um, I was really intrigued by your answer when I asked you about uh, who you were, who you felt responsible to, or what you felt, felt responsible, uh, what institutions you felt responsible to. Please, if you could just um, enlighten us. Right. Um, thank you. Um, so uh, this is what I I feel. I first of all, I think I have to talk about what my positioning is um, within all of this. First of all, um, as, you, as you mentioned in your introduction, I'm a lecturer in world literatures in English, in an English department, but I'm an Africanist. And that's the, the sort of work that I do. I do lit I'm a literary critic and a cultural historian, and I've increasingly been doing cultural history in the past years. I barely do any lit crit as of now. So the question is, how does one navigate these um, sometimes muddy waters. The whole idea of world literatures is quite loaded and is again um, a Western attempt at classification that I don't necessarily agree with, but that's my job title and that's the job that I have to do. So um, in, in my case, to decolonize means to de-exoticize and to centralize knowledge. The, uh, the, the field of African studies as, as a field of inquiry to relate to my students that this field doesn't exist for the appeasement of political demands or because of the contingencies of the times or because of um, demographic um, um, requirements or statistics, but rather it is as central to um, world knowledge. And by world knowledge, I'm not using it in the world literature's sense of the term um, as everything else in the syllabus. Um, so what I see is that the problem is not just, um, ha just doesn't have to do exclusively with decolonizing the canon or opening up the canon as such, but in what ways are these literary texts that I teach, for instance, presented vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the literary texts that are taught in my department and in my institution? What are students told these courses are supposed to do? Why do these students take these courses? A lot of the time, my first days of class, I ask them, why are you taking 
um, the post-colonial novel, for instance. Oh, I want to learn about all the cultures. But um, no, you know, I, I, I don't just, I just feel that it is my duty and my responsibility to do away with this thought that you can just do intellectual tourism of this kind, that you've got to um, engage with this text and the histories that I teach um, with the same rigor that you apply to everything else that you're doing. So um, basically what I feel that I have to do is to use Ngugi Wationgo's words uh, to reconfigure the cognitive base and process um, to center the post-colonial in the world of knowing. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. So it sounds to me like you're saying that you also feel that you very much have a responsibility to the text and to the context out of which those texts arrive. Right. Um, Beth, um, can you answer that question for us? Who do you think you're responsible to or, or what institutions are you responsible for? To? Uh, thank you. Um, well, just to give sort of a, an overview of the kind of collection that I work for. So I work, um, I'm the curator for Arts Council England's collection. So, mm -hmm. um, and that's cared for by Southbank Centre. So I'm sort of between two very large organisations. Um, and we, you know, tracing back the history of Arts Council Collection, we take on the history of lots of sort of a part of the history of each of those organisations, which shapes where we, we came to. Um, we have just over 8,000 artworks, but we've only been around for 75 years. So we're a modern and contemporary collection. Um, so when it comes to thinking about who I feel responsible to, I, um, I feel responsible to each of the artists, the creators of each of those 8,000 artworks to mm. care for them sensitively, correctly. Um, I mean, we're really fortunate that um, the majority of the artists of those artworks are still with us. So there can be a continuing dialogue and continuing conversation with those artists as we lend them because we are a lending collection. So um, we don't have a, a permanent gallery. We're not attached to a, a certain locality, um, but we lend across the UK and internationally. So I feel responsible to those artists um, first and foremost, but then um, we are a publicly funded collection. Um, we're funded by taxpayer money um, largely, and we are a constantly acquiring collection, which is a really fortunate place to be in there's not many collections that can purchase new artworks year on year so every year um, it is a responsibility that we are um, capturing that year in British art and we have a very sort of wide definition of what what is British art there's lots of uh, contested ideas around national identity there um, but so each year we have responsibility because um, the collection is sort of this continuing growing active entity and as we're adding to it year on year, we're shaping that identity even more and we're shaping that. And they're, they're all active decisions, you know, for everybody that we, we include in the collection. There's a lot of people that we're not including in that collection. Mm. Um, so I feel responsible uh, in some ways to, um, to future me, to future audiences, as much as I do to the contemporary and the current audience, because it's um, we're historicizing all of these um, stories, all of these experiences, which form a strand uh, and a, a narrative strand, which will give an understanding of, you know, each year, British life in each year as we go. So I feel a responsibility um, for that kind of element of historicizing. Um, yeah, that's good. Uh, that's, that's, that's great, that's really clear. And it reminds me actually of what Dan Hicks said to me when we spoke on the phone a few days ago, he said something about feeling responsible uh, to his ancestors and descendants mm -hmm. and, 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 and talked about, well, I'll let you take it from there, Dan. Okay, absolutely, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think it, it, um, for me, I mean, I could easily answer in the ways that, that others have in terms of our responsibility to visitors, to students, to the living. Mm -hmm. um, but as an anthropologist and an archaeologist who works in a museum that was so central to empire, mm -hmm. where, you know, you know, the fake racial sciences of anthropology's past are here in the present mm -hmm. and where art and culture were put to work, you know, to tell histories and ideologies of, you know, victory, you know, supremacy. And that means in some ways my responsibility is something I can describe as 
if you like, a responsibility to the ancestors mm. who were represented in this institution. And, and I think that falls into two parts. So there are the ancestors of the white men after which you know, institutions are named. I'm, mm. I'm in a named museum at the Pitt Rivers. Um, so we're named after a soldier and an archaeologist and anthropologist and all those things actually intersect in that way. You know, and at the same time, I'm in an institution that has the remains of ancestors, mm. of, of other people's ancestors, mm. you know, which have been in the past on display until incredibly recently, which are now in the storerooms, just actually uh, sort of here in the museum, actually, mm. you know, they are only, if you like, only meters away from me now, you know, and mm. I think as we're seeing at the moment of the conversations at Harvard and at the Penn Museum about how much uh, longer we can't just shut the doors and ignore what's, you know, you know, what's in the collections, because in many ways, anthropology and the museums it built, you know, were actually made in order to make the violence and those ideologies sort of last. So our role in some ways is to sort of if you take apart, you know, that white infrastructure, and that means a form of humanizing, you know, which isn't going to repeat the liberal humanizations that anthropology was founded on. We need to go to something other than the, you know, the model of the human as a universal and to find a way in these museums where we're, we're able to care for people more than things, mm. but, but actually with a different sort of humanity that, you know, that sort of informs, you know, what we're doing. Right, precisely. So I am very much a proponent of defining our terms. I think it's really key, especially for audiences who are just tuning in and aren't may not be familiar with everyone on the panel or with the work or with the work that we do. When we say, when we use a term like decolonization, um, it's really important, I think, for everyone to kind of get a sense of what we each mean by using that term. And I think that decolonization really does show up, I mean, very much so in, in, um, in the answers given by Sandeep and Terry, and I think in, in, in a lot of ways, in, and, and Dan, but implicitly so in the, in the answers given by Diana and, um, and Beth, who are really caring for collections and for the implied visitor who will come to these collections with um, uh, um, uh, uh, hopefully a kind of openness and a kind of, um, there, that is to say, you, um, Beth and Diana are very interested in creating access and diversity is sort of implied in that. And I think diversity is a kind of key component to decolonization. But I want to ask everyone, um, what precisely do you mean when you say, like Sandeep, when you say you're, you're very interested in decolonizing knowledge itself, not, not just a canon, but knowledge itself. What does a decolonialized set of knowledges look like to you? Thank you. Thank you, Sefa. And I think uh, Terry started that off really well um, when she talked about um, knowledges from the South, mm -hmm. um, which have to be taken with the same intellectual rigor. And she's talked about intellectual tourism. And, and, and I'll credit her for that word every time, the term, every time I'll use it now. Thank mm. you, Terry. So um, I think decolonization has now become, we know the buzzword that everyone wants to use, mm -hmm. you know, it ignites many passions. Um, and relentlessly, I would say used and abused. Mm. It has its own trajectory that makes takes on multiple meanings in contemporary times. So for me, it's there are two ways to look at it. Um, and I think both are correct. Um, there is nothing incorrect in that way. So it's coeval with, on the one hand, independence movements from mm. colonial powers in the 20th century that we all know of. And that it has another frame of epistemic erasure or what decolonial thinkers call um, I don't like this term, but I'll still use it as shorthand, Eurocentered formation of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So among these circulations is also the critical departure in terms of land rights of native and in indigenous peoples, not mm -hmm. just in the Americas, 
or Australia and New Zealand, mm -hmm. but appears, it also appears as a useful category in thinking of Indian occupation of Kashmir and expropriation mm. from the lands of Adivasis, the allegedly scheduled tribes of India, and the erasure, or rather the extinction of such meaningful ways of life. Mm -hmm. So decolonization, as has been signaled, is not just a metaphor, not a performative, but a doing, an action, a politics, mm. an ethical imperative, a way mm. of being in our world. So in conjunction with this reminder of what decolonization entails within knowledge formation frames, decolonization has developed its own critical grammar. And that is what I'm most compelled by. So the three ideas that move the discussion forwards for me are those of learn, do, and think. So we have useful connections between unlearning, undoing, epistemological modes of research. Mm. What I feel that in terms of knowledge formation, we need to deploy is unthinking, such that when we unbraid systems of knowledge that have gained hegemonic control over our research and teaching, we can attach our modes of thinking to other genealogies of knowledge uh, that have been erased out of history. Um, we all know that we work in the universities of the global north, um, and we need to go beyond the, you know, the tokenistic service today of providing alternative reading lists, including works that are again written in one of the imperial languages even though emanating from the global south. So today, if I am doing postcolonial literature that comes out of Africa or South Asia, I'm basically dealing with texts that were written or produced in an imperial language, which is English in this case. Um, it is this regard that I say that we can only partially decolonize the university. It's not necessarily an admission of failure. You see, the university belongs to all of us and we can think collectively how best to encompass our multiple experiences. But there is a proliferation of quality research from the global south, and we ignore that research at our own peril in the global north. I'd like to give an example from my field of specialism, which is in gender and sexuality studies. So when we are involved in the process of unthinking, say how gender and sexuality have been traditionally conceived in the global north along the axis of binaries, as we all know, mm -hmm. we realize that far numerous multiple sexual and gender configurations exist in various parts of the world with their own histories, both pre and post-colonial, and that do not need to be excavated as such because they're already there. We need to just dismantle a system, undo the binary in a more comprehensive way, rather than adding these systems, uh, these histories as plain addendums of, to reading lists on queer theory, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, Another, one, another example that I can give um, is, of course, from um, literature. So instead of dwelling on the what of knowledge, we include the how of knowledge. And I think Terry signaled that um, a little bit in, in her response at the beginning. Mm -hmm. How these knowledge systems came to be, say, dominant or Eurocentered by erasing colonized systems of knowledges that several times were documented as in written, but at other times, lay in the interstices of orality and writing. These histories do not need to be recovered, as I said, because they exist, but they need to be placed in conjunction, perhaps not the center, perhaps the center, but at least in parallel so that we can assess the quality and appreciate the knowledge produced by each of these systems. Now I'd like to just um, come back to Nugugi uh, Thiongo, who Terry cited as well. So Thiongo talks about a quest for relevance. This quest for relevance, as he suggests, is the search for a liberating perspective within which to see ourselves clearly in relation to ourselves and to other selves in the universe. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll stop here and probably come back to the literary canon if there is time. Right. Well, I think that that dovetails from what I can, um, from what I can tell, it dovetails with uh, some of the understandings that I get of what decolonial, decolonialization means to Terry because you're talking about knowledge production and, and, and behaving essentially um, in, in sort of crude terms, if you're creating a class syllabus, you're not, you're not using these particular histories from what you're calling the global south and t terming them alternative. You're actually treating them as if they have their own um, valid and um, um, productive and um, important standing in the world alongside these other histories that we may be already more familiar with. Terry, does that, that sound like um, part of how you think about the term? Yeah, absolutely. And um, I, would, I would want to elaborate a little bit more on that. 
um, by, I absolutely agree with everything you see, say, Sandy, about the tokenistic um, fashions that everyone seems to be following nowadays. Um, you hear such things as that, oh, I've got to decolonize my syllabus. I've got to think about, um, let me get some black writer from the 18th century and just inject them in there, you know, and, and that sort of thing. And there really doesn't seem, and yeah, that's all very nice and dandy, I think. Um, there are ways in which this is seen, I think, in the mainstream as being active decolonization, but I absolutely disagree. What decolonization means to me is the acknowledgement by everyone involved, institutions, um, colleagues working in the more traditional disciplines and um, literatures and traditions and so on, that what we do um, is, um, well, you know, the, the sense of equity really, you know, it's as rigorous, it's as profound, and it's as central as what they do. So, for instance, um, I specialize um, to some extent, you know, that's part of what I do on the work of Nigerian writer Chinua Achebe. And Things Fall Apart is this text that is a must read if you're trying to decolonize your mind some way, somehow. That's the way it's upheld, that's the way, the way it's taught. And um, so we do that in our first year in a sort of survey, um, sort of uh, course on the novel that we teach. But then I've got this, called, this course, um, which is a third year's option called the post-colonial novel. And then students come with this sense that things fall apart is interesting because it's writing against or writing back to Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, uh, Joyce Carey's Mr. Johnson. So it, it, the, the perception actually, which they bring from their previous education um, within the university itself, I'm not, I'm not talking about you know, secondary school, is that all these writers are, are writing against something that is Western. So it centralizes the West. Mm. What I do in my corrective teaching, which I don't need to broadcast in, in a syllabus or in, in anywhere else, you know, is basically say, yes, Heart of Darkness, Joyce, Gary, Mr. Johnson, there's some of um, things all apart into text or those of Arrow of God. But to me, the main in, in intertext is actually a pre-colonial art form called Mbari, which mm. actually consisted of this museum um, of, uh, well, I'm using museum in the Western sense, you know, so as to be, you know, try to illustrate what it means, but it was this collection of sort of mod sculptures that were offered up to a goddess. And there were what, some of the modes in which um, the Igbo people historicized um, the colonial encounter and all the changes in their society, right? And he taps into this art form for um, some of its conventions and also in the very form of the novel, the very ways in which he constructs the world of the novel, the ways in which he represents colonial whiteness, for instance. So if I'm teaching this and relaying this to the students, I'm decolonizing mm -hmm. by just teaching Arrow of God, I'm not doing that. If I say, oh, Arrow of God is actually a response to all of these colonial anthropological texts, um, or, you know, Heart of Darkness, then I'm still saying uh, this text is marginal to the tradition. It's mm -hmm. just engaging with the tradition and not on, on equal terms. Mm -hmm. And that, that seems to dovetail with um, the work that you did, Diana, with your book, because what you did was you basically said, look, we have this bias towards certain kinds of um, narratives about 19th century painting. And, and we're leaving aside these other uh, 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 narratives that are just as vital, just as rich, just as provocative, um, uh, uh, and there's no and there's no reason for that kind of bias except for the fact that we inherited it and we just kind of don't know how to don't know how to consciously in the way that that kind of Sandeep and 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 Terry have talked about at least in the classroom don't know how to consciously get ourselves out of that predicament. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's a great characterization. Um, and I, I also, I, Terry, thank you for intellectual tourism. I also wrote that down. So I will be crediting you too. Um, yeah, I think that's something when you're dealing with museums and we have to think about is this real institutional inertia, right? Mm -hmm. We have these physical collections of objects and just the accretion of decisions that were made by people starting back in the 19th century through the 20th century and we've inherited these collections. So you end up with this core of objects that were formed with a very particular point of view or institutional orientation, but that's never exposed 
necessarily. It's sort of just accepted as is. Um, and something that I've tried to do is again, by using kind of these traces like old inventories about what was actually shown. Um, I work quite a bit on women artists and the dismissal of still life as something that is worthy of collection and being shown or the marginalization of works on paper, which tend to have the most diverse rosters of artists and yet they're the least shown, mm -hmm. right? It's all oil on canvas that gets mm -hmm. kind of the big banner events. Um, and so I think by really exposing literally in graphs how these things are edited i i like to view it as a way of um providing a really clear critique of the results of all of those decisions and of those biases that we can at least grapple with today now part of the problem and and you know i i don't work at an acquiring institution so it was it was interesting to hear beth's perspective right is then how do we correct for a hundred years of those biases or more um, that are now in collections and are forming the core of these institutions with funding with names as dan said and so i i'm sort of jealous of my colleagues in the classroom for some of the the nimbleness that maybe they can have sometimes, although you're working against incredible headwinds within a university institution as well, right? Um, because I think museums can be glacial in their change in part because of this weight of the collections that we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and do you find, Beth, that you're dealing with that kind of institutional inertia as well? Um, I mean, one of the things that, that seems to be coming out to the surface in the conversation now is that in some ways like um if we can think about decolonization as this kind of um uh effort to produce knowledge um uh then you can do that it's sort of the university sort of the the machine for that it is a knowledge production machine whereas collections and and um uh 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 museums tend to be knowledge producing machines as well, but they're slower. They're the sort of more, they're the sort of 1.0 version. Whereas, uh, whereas uh, it feels like if you're in a class, if you're, if you're a researcher and you're a lecturer and you're in the classroom, you can sort of find, ex, ex, well, Sandeep, I think you might object to my using the term excavate, but you can, you can locate these histories that we're presumed to be alternative to the West, right? And you can you can make a case for them within your classroom, within your within your group, with your group of students. You can co-produce knowledge in the moment. Whereas in the museum, it seems that, and with um, large collections, it seems like that kind of co-production of knowledge is less possible because by the time the visitor comes to the place where they're sort of in dialogue with you as a as a as a caption writer you as a wall text uh writer that you've already done the kind of co-production of knowledge with your colleagues in the back room so it's difficult i think for um the kind of the kind of like hands-on kind of like intellectually wrestling with things that happens in the classroom to happen in the same way in a museum beth dan do you find that that's the case I mean, yeah, there's a few points that um, that I wanted to make. So one is definitely, I see a big part of my job is not about showing our collection just in the museum and gallery setting, because assuming that people um, will come through the door will is a filter is a huge filtering process. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of what I do, um, probably 50% of what I do is not just working with museums and galleries, but I work with schools, um, hospitals, libraries, and um, any public facing space really we don't lend to any private residencies but um it's about making sure that our artwork is being out and about um more than the museum and gallery setting mm -hmm. um and i think i need to credit dan maybe for this um comment but i'm i'm fairly certain i've heard you say that um and it really stuck with me that the perception of a curator is that we've got to make everything stop and that we've got to preserve and just make everything sort of 
stay in time and then uh, it will be like that forever and that it mm. takes away this element that to be a curator is an active role um, mm. and it's really active and it's got agency with it and the decisions we make are really powerful e even the small decisions we make on a day-to-day -day basis um, and one thing that I've been really uh, interested in is specifically for my collection is looking at where our money gets spent um, because that is a real tell time sound of who we value what we value at any given time and our acquisitions process has been one that I'm trying to drill down in because um, with a lot of acquisitions models of acquisitioning across uh, the UK it, it um, relies on a meritocracy it relies on the idea that if you apply and you've got the time to do an application and you can put that free labor in or you've got the time to apply for this fund or that fund or do a residency in this way or that way then um, that again becomes a massive filtering process and actually how do we start to chip away at those barriers to then um, make sure that you know the collection the story that we're building does become more equitable um, um, Dan how do you respond to that do you do you do you find that um, collections are uh, unwieldy in the way that Diana is talking about and that um, in the way that Beth um, alluded to that um, uh, part of the way that you can address the sort of colonial inheritance is by looking at ways to create more access to collections. Yes, I guess so in some ways. I mean, it's interesting hearing about the museums who are acquiring because a part of our work at the moment, of course, is to return objects when asked. Mm -hmm. So restitution and the physical dismantling of that sort of kind mm -hmm. has a relationship, I think, with something that's incredibly important for us at the moment here in Oxford, when we talk in the, you know, not only in the abstract about the decolonial, but in the practical things we can do, you know, which is, you know, the continuing sort of issue over Cecil Rhodes. So the, actually the Rose Must Fall Oxford campaign centered a dead white man you know in order to fight racism because it was about the physical removal of the image so there are ways i think i think there's a whole set of reasons we should be in you know amazingly worried when the museum's world starts saying they're going to de decolonize because for many it's just a way of saying some things that's going to hit some uh, some of the notes around you know, diversity, inclusion, or the language of hospitality that finds its way into this space, mm -hmm. rather than what we're really talking about, you know, which is the unfinished work of, of anti-colonialism and of anti-racism and of abolition. And I think that word abolition and that sense that abolition is not over and abolition continues. So in the museum, as we work, as, as, as I think we move in between the space of the museum, which is a public space, mm. and the space of the library, which often isn't, mm. you know, are there ways in which we can recognize that there are history books that, you know, that have been uh, written as if erecting a statue, that there are history books and indeed works of uh, literature, I'm sure, that have been written as if they were you know, looting a continent, as if they were seeking to speak over others. Mm. Um, there are there are forms of making knowledge that can ob that can seek to turn people into objects in, you know, exactly the same way that happens in the museum. So maybe that means that we can start, you know, teaching, researching um and and operating you know also here in the museum you know as if we are removing a statue as if we are returning an object as if mm. you know we are seeking to undo that white infrastructure so for all those reasons you know i think we learned from the museum that this has to be about more than just the rewriting of the label right mm -hmm. this isn't about adding in further perspectives mm -hmm. because you know and actually for me it isn't you know, only about, you know, the fact of me seeking to acknowledge my perspective, my positionality, I need to undermine 
you, you, you know, that perspective. I need mm -hmm. to undermine myself in this role, you know, where in, you know, in amazingly, you know, white institutions. And that's for a reason, because I think the knowledge, you know, ecologies have this ongoing you know, relationship with empire. So when I hear my my colleagues in history or, 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 or indeed other fields saying we need to diversify what's on the reading lists and the citation practices and so on, of course, you know, absolutely all that work is important. But we can't just add in more perspectives. We have to look at the heart of this, you know, issue. We need to f find ways to dismantle these structures, which are institutional racism ultimately, so we can make things ultimately, you know, moving forward in some way that isn't just a virtue signal. Well, this is super reminiscent of what Sandeep just said about unthinking. Um, he, 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 he said. Um, if I might paraphrase you, Cindy, um, feel free to jump in. But you you said that the, the sort of um, aside from the sort of um, issues of land and appropriation of land and um, the independent movements, that the um, decolonization happening in in um, the sort of intellectual realm of knowledge production, that part for you, the the really key component is unthinking. Right, so it's not just a it's dismantling. It's, it's I think moving towards what Rich, what Dan is talking about when he says abolition. And I have to say that I my hackles go up when I hear people say um, things like we should abolish museums. In fact, um, hypoallergic just well, with my assistance because I edited the the piece. We just published a piece last week. Um, I think with the title we should we should abolish museums, and it, it was one of the most read pieces of the week. Um, and it garnered a lot of vehement uh, 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 arguments uh, uh, on Facebook. Um, but I think that moves towards this thing that you're both, that we're maybe all getting at, which is this uh, kind of um, unpicking, this kind of um, the unsettling, this kind of uh, unthinking. Am I, uh, am I following you correctly, Sandy? Yes, 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 you are. And, and I think I, I was just trying to, um, I think Terry, Terry makes it a very elegant, um, though I'm, I'm, and, and I don't want to take, take more time, but what I was thinking of uh, was particularly these three words that come up every time we think of decolonization is unlearning, undoing, and unthinking. So I'm not, mm -hmm. you cannot dismantle structures, um, as Audre Lorde would say, with the language of the master. Tools. Right. Just tools, right? right. So right. I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, how do you unthink? Because thinking is active as well. Mm -hmm. And this is not just unthinking as, if, um, as, a, as, a, as a response to Descartes of, I think, therefore I am. But it's also about, I'm going to go back where it all started to the genealogical practices, um, to the archives that have always existed um, mm. in pre-colonial, post-colonial times, because mm -hmm. they have their own intellectual uh, frame. And I think mm -hmm. Terry was uh, saying it much better than I was. So I'll mm. probably let her carry on mm -hmm. from here. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know, should I elaborate on what you said or add something to what I was just saying? Um, thank you for your words. Um, no, I think I'm, I'm as I'm not going to say I'm pessimistic about the potential of decolonization because I'm not. Um, but in, in in my case, I think again the, the other things that we've got to sit to bring to the table, I guess, that also have to do with hierarchies. I think it's different when you hire up in the professional scale, maybe be, you know being a professor, than when you you know a, a young scholar just, you know, getting your first permanent position to start shape things around. Um, I'm not sure I'm someone who functions very well in very overt sort of political gestures, but I, I feel like um, um, because of my own experience of my field, because of the person I am, the different selves that constitute myself, and also my grappling with the knowledge that I try to transmit to my students. I feel that informs my own decolonizing processes rather than the imperatives of an institution or society or system. For me, diversity and inclusion are 
terms that I just um, allergic to because of the ways in which you know they're used. Um, I just uh, deride uh, tokenistic incursions in knowledge production in all their forms. So I just think very carefully. Um, not I just don't think that the decolonizing thing or aspect of my role as lecturer of world literatures in English is creating new courses per se, or teaching um, courses on post, the post-colonial novel and so on and so forth, but rather making them do this kind of work. Um, which, which is, sorry, what kind of work is that? When you say do this well, kind the, of- The kind of work that I mean is that what, what I was referring to earlier, which is the centralizing of non-Western knowledge. Mm. And the ways in which you do that is not by offering taster style courses, like mm. the post-colonial novel. So let's pick up Chinua Achebe, Salman Rushdie, um, this and that, and, and offer you a little, you know, sort of taster menu. Right. But rather what I, I do is think of a theme around which the entire course will revolve. In my own case, I've made it revolve around the configuration of identities in liminal spaces. And so that is what drives the choice of text that I teach. Mm -hmm. And um, my experience in looking at student reviews and letters I've, got, I've gotten from them eventually, mm -hmm. the students learn to leave those preconceptions that they had of non-Western knowledge behind and focus on the issues at hand and right, the right. theories that we use to unpack them and so on and so forth. So it's about, be, it's about being really driven by ideas and not by like location and not by hierarchies and not, not by um, notions that what, this form of knowledge is, is more genuine or more authentic or more valid than this other um, history or form of knowledge. Great, um, so that actually leads me to take up one of the questions that have come through from the audience. They are asking us to respond to uh, the question, do we have any examples of something approaching good practice that we might share? I feel like we've sort of kind of implicitly given um, an answer to, to this question, but I, I think I wanna make it explicit. Like what is a good practice as a curator, as a collections curator, as, as a lecturer, as someone who, um, as a researcher, what, yeah, let's, let's, I suppose, give a kind of as plain a response as we can for uh, the audience. I can take that one sure, maybe sure. For, for a museum setting. Um, so I think one example of good practice is making sure to try and co-produce knowledge that's going to show up in interpretation for exhibitions. Um, mm. So I'm going to give a shout out to my colleague, my, my boss, Nat Silver, who curated a fantastic show called Boston's Apollo. It was about John Singer Sargent, who's a 19th century white male American artist and his relationship with a model named Thomas McKellar. Oh, who's... yes, I know about this show. My boss yeah. actually Krog, told me that I should go see the show and I should get the. Yes, it's it's I'll send you a catalog. Yes, please yeah. do, please do. And yeah. Thomas got he got top billing, by the way, it's Thomas McKellar and John Singer Sargent. And it's about mm. their collaboration as model and artist, but also mm. the very problematic ways in which Sargent erased Thomas's race mm -hmm. and gender even in the mm -hmm. final murals that he was posing for. Mm. And so, you know, to, to my colleagues credit, this was before I arrived at the Gardner, although the show happened while I was here, there were a series of consultations and convenings with academics, with the community, with the black community in Boston mm -hmm. um, that were very much just facilitated by the curators. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was to listen and our, and our, co our collaborators wrote text, right? It was trying to break apart this like disembodied museum text. There Great. were signed labels. Um, everyone is of course compensated for their labor, right? I think that it is this trying to do, it sounds like what Terry and Sandeep are doing in the classroom mm -hmm. where you are collaborating, mm -hmm. right? As a group to produce knowledge and then bringing that into the museum I think is good practice. The key is that museums just have to start it early. This is not something that can be tacked on at the end of an exhibition process. Precisely. It has to start from kind of conception and the years out that this takes. So that's why I think one example. Great, that's fantastic. Anyone else? Anyone at all? 
I think uh, one part of uh, a better practice for us was we are a relatively modern co uh, collection, but we still managed to cloud and, um, and obfuscate our own history, our 75 year history. Mm -hmm. And we don't make it clear about the, who the decision makers are. And, um, you know, this collection didn't just organically form like a cloud in the sky. We wanted to, um, one thing we've been trying to uncover not uncover it, but sort of um, make more transparent, be more bold about is sharing the fact that um, the collection reflects the inequalities of the wider world. It is a, it's a microcosm of that um, wider world. And that didn't just happen by accident. Um, mm -hmm. And in the, some of the research that we do with the Decarnize and the Arts Institute at University of Arts London is about how we're going to help presenting that um, and making sure that we are being transparent and not trying to sort of cloud the recent past as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good practice. Anyone can jump in. And so, yeah, I mean, I wonder if I could just underline mm -hmm. the risks of mm -hmm. extraction mm -hmm. from the wider communities with whom we're working. And I think what's happening, you know, in Oxford at the moment, elsewhere in the UK, you know, is an increasing awareness that we need to build these uh, relationships into something more than just the temporary exhibits, mm -hmm. but into the long term activity of our institution. So it's about community building, but it's also it isn't going to be anything like what we're aiming for if we're not losing power somehow, if we're not actually mm -hmm. you know, giving something up. So mm -hmm. we need and a part of that is a seat at the table. A part of it is knowing when to pass the mic. Indeed. And I feel like that happens in the classroom a lot. I mean, I don't have the kind of extensive teaching experience I think that Sandeep or Terry or uh, Dan have, but uh, I have taught at um, the School of Visual Arts in New York City and at Parsons. Uh, and what I found is that even in the classroom, even asking the sort of most mundane, anodyne questions, posing them to students, students feel that they're risking a lot that they're risking, they, they'd like, you can see it in some of their faces, that they feel like they're almost going through an existentialist crisis by having to answer the question out loud in front of their colleagues, right? Like, um, so, I can, so I think that getting back to not, not a feeling of panic, but that feeling of like you are actually risking something in the moment of uh, the co-production of knowledge, um, um, in the moment of um, um, finding ways to welcome more people to your collection, to your art collection, finding um, stories that are, uh, 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 are created collaboratively with audiences. I think that there is a real sense there of uh, a, a real marker of a good practice is that sense of, okay, this actually might fail. Right? And, I, and, I, and, I, and I, want, I want that to be, I think that, that that, just that basic idea is very peripheral to the um, US American ethos. Um, nobody fails in our culture. Like everybody's, or everybody tries to, everybody who is a hard worker will eventually win. And I want to say that um, that kind of that kind of idea comes out of um, a very sort of imperial history. Um, it comes out of the notion that the sun will never set on the Union Jack, right? Um, and I think that what we what all the panelists are doing really is in in and this is a key component for me of decolonization is you're putting something at risk. You're you're risking something yourself. Um, it is not just a matter of pointing to that institution and saying that the institution has to fall or this practice has to stop, but you are actually putting in some ways intellectually, emotionally, um, um, uh, maybe even uh, in terms of your gainful employment, you are putting something on the line. And, and, and with that, I want to give the last word. We're just, I think we're running out of time. I want to give the last word to Terry. Um, uh, what do you think is the key, if, if there is, if you do agree with that kind of premise, do, what do you think is the sort of key risk that needs to be taken um, 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 uh, in, in, in the classroom um, uh, for decol the, the decolonization movement to really have any sort of purchase? 
I think the key thing is, um, and this is something I do in the first two, three sessions of every um, optional course that I teach, not the mainstream ones, mm -hmm. is that you've got to let students know exactly um, how the canon is created, mm -hmm. who is involved in the creating of the canon. You've got to actually question these labels, diversion, inclusivity, um, uh, decolonization, and you've got to, to, to actually bring, bring the discussion to the classroom and actually challenge it, even when um, these are terms that they've been bombarded with, um, either by the media or the institution. You've got to, when we talk about colonial discourse, what is colonial discourse? Mm -hmm. What purpose does it serve? What are its permutations in the present? I mean, uh, you've got students who, who all on social media, in what ways are colonial discourses about Africa representing the sorts of images that they consume on Instagram, for instance. They've got to see these are living things and these are not just fashions that need to be tackled. These are not just, uh, the courses are not ways to learn a little about some culture. You can't learn a culture by reading a novel deriving from that culture. So I'm very upfront about what needs to be done. And I'm very frank in my conversations with the students. And I do try to create an ambience in which everyone feels safe mm. to tackle their own positionalities, both mm. for my non-white students and students who have colonial connections in their past, who actually bring them into the classroom and discuss things that they've heard at their, um, about their family histories and so on and so forth. So we, you just have to bring everything in the open and not be shy about things, I guess. Yes, and thank you all for not being shy about things today. I really appreciate being able to talk with all of you. Terry Ocella, Sandeep Bakshi, Beth Hughes, Dana Greenwald, and Dan Hicks. I um, am honored that you have shared this time with me and your ideas with me. And uh, I do feel very much feel blessed by, um, by this conversation. Thank you all. And uh, I want to wrap this up by saying that we, um, uh, the recording of this event will be available on the FEPS Festival YouTube channel, which will be accessed, can be accessed from the Watch Again section of the festival website after the 20th of June. Um, and if you'd like to find out more uh, about the panelists' work, you can find copies of Dan and Diane's books available from our partner bookseller, Fox Lane Books. And for more information on book sales, PC the website. Uh, again, I thank you all. I am Seth Rodney. Um, uh, it's been my distinct pleasure today to talk with um, my colleagues on um, responsibility, representation, and restrictions. Good day.